Peter's fail overflow. All right. All right. Thank you. So speaking of owning a PS3, actually, we'll get to that in a minute. You know, I should start out by saying that I'm bushing. And here we have Sven, Mark, and Seger. Uh, we are. Say her. Say her, excuse me. Uh, we are just four members of a uh, team fail overflow. Unfortunately, we sort of overflowed the number of speakers, so the rest of them are, you know, here in the front aisle. Uh, it's an international team with, uh, I think we have members on almost every continent. Um, let's see. Uh, we may be familiar faces because um, anyway, two years ago, we presented, uh, Mark and I presented on uh, some of the hacks we'd done for the Wii. Uh, a year before that, I had demonstrated the first unsigned code execution on the Wii here at 24C3. Uh, 2008, uh, uh, us Wii hackers, together with some of the iPhone hackers that I know, uh, worked together as Wii phonies. We uh, won the capture the flag of that year and then decided to change our name to Fail Overflow for a variety of reasons. And since then, we've been collaborating on various embedded and thought expansive projects, the most famous of which that hit the press earlier this year was the full reconstruction of the allowing to be completely broken. That was a fun couple of weeks. <laughs> so on the subject of the Wii, since that's really what we have the most experience with or are most known for, um, Wii's been out for about three years. It's been three years since we demonstrated that unsigned code execution. In that time, Nintendo has released nine firmware updates, and of all those updates, eight of them were contrived. Only one of them had an actual real feature that somebody would want, namely the ability to run uh, games off of an SD card. Every single other feature was background improvements to improve system performance, which really was their code for patching vulnerabilities. Um, according to VG charts, they sold about 73 million consoles, which I think is the highest of all the consoles. Correct, and uh, of those, we estimate that about 30 million of them were produced before they fixed the bug, uh, where the hash comparison bug that we had disclosed. Um, and so these people were fortunate enough to be able to run Boot Me, our alternate bootloader that we ran, uh, wrote for the Wii. Uh, we actually ended up putting a lot of time into that because one of the biggest challenges for us hacking on the Wii was not really the protection, but really the fragility of the thing. The software is very, very fragile, and there are very, very, very many ways to accidentally brick the device and no way to fix it. So we put time into making something that would simply let you unbrick your Wii. Um, and you know, as of, uh, I believe, since, since September of this year, uh, we are proud to announce we have one million unique users of the Homebrew channel. So that's over 1% of all users of all owners of Wii's have installed our Homebrew channel. So that was a... <laughs> so I'd say we had a pretty good run. <laughs> so let's take a look at what consoles we have here. So there's first the Wii, which was released at the end of 2006. Then the Xbox 360, was, which was released about a year earlier, and the PS3 was released at about the same time like the Xbox and like the Wii. And so the Wii was pretty much broken from the beginning because they were like drive chips, which allowed pirated games to be run and um, GameCube homebrew. And then after a year, it was like fully broken, and Nintendo tried to fix it again and again, but well, they failed. So in the end, it's just broken and it's still broken, and it probably will be broken. So then we have the Xbox 360. It has a really good security system, and there were only like two major hacks, which was the King Kong hack, which was demonstrated, I think, two years ago, or three years, and then the JTAG hack. But those were minor bugs, and Microsoft was just able to fix them. So, okay, the drives are completely hacked, so we could also mark the whole thing here in red and in blood, but, um, well, we don't care about piracy. It does not allow homebrew code, and. We don't care about running code others wrote. We want to run our own code. So, and then there's finally the PS3. So the difference here is that the PS3 originally supported Linux. So no one really cared other than, other than one single thing where you cannot re really use the 3D features on Linux. So they found some way to get around that. Sony pushed a firmware update because they didn't want that and they fixed it. So, well, but still nothing happened. But then Sony decided to release the Slim. So they claimed they don't want Linux or they, they're not going to support Linux because they want to save money. Well, today we know that this is bullshit because Linux just runs on the Slim without any huge code modif modifications. So it was just something they claimed to do, but it's, not, it's certainly not true. <coughs> and 
after that, people actually started to care. And a few months later, GeoHot tried to break the hypervisor, which is going to ex be explained later. And Sony's reaction was to remove Linux. And then finally, the jailbreak happened. And yeah, in the end, we're going to present some new hacks. And the PlayStation 3 is likely going to look like the Wii afterwards. So hi, my name is Michael Style. And I'm not actually part of those guys, but um, if you remember, there's been um, an, a console hacking talk for um, the, at, at least the last eight years, every year. And um, every once in a while, I get a cameo in one of these talks because I look at the big picture, at the statistics about what's going on in the hacking space. And it's always the same thing I want to say, which is Linux is inevitable. Um, either you support Linux on your hardware or it will be hacked, so it'll run sooner or later. Correlation is not causation, but I have some good statistics to back that up. So if you look at the devices, so this, this is the slide that I gave, um, that I presented three years ago um, in another one of these talks. Um, with, these are, were the systems that were available at that time and the years when they came out. Um, the, how good the security system was, so darker, darker red colors means very good, very sophisticated, very complicated security system. And as time progressed, it got better, but the smaller systems still had weaker security systems because it just wasn't that easy to implement them in smaller, in smaller space. This column shows you how long it took to have these systems hacked. And yeah, there's some correlation between a complicated security system and hacking the system. And the question is, why d did it get hacked? And the statistics clearly show here that, except for the first one, the PlayStation, a very long time ago, all of them were always done for the sole purpose of running homebrew software, running Linux, just running your own code because you own the hardware. And there has always been that side effect of, well, if you open it, if you can run anything on it, you can run pirated games on it because the keys have leaked or the whole DRM system is just not in place anymore. But there's one here that is special. No, wait, let, let me first update the slide. So the iPad, same thing as the iPhone. <laughs> OK, so let's, uh, let's look at the PlayStation 3. This one is special because, well, the security system looks like it's kind of sophisticated. And as of, well, three years ago and even a year ago, it, it was not hacked. But so this, this has changed. So now after, after four years, it has finally been hacked. And you could say it's, it's got hacked for piracy, homebrew. Um, I let those guys decide and argue on that. Um, and of course, there's always the side effect. So piracy is possible, or was possible, whatever. But you could also look at it from another perspective, which is um, if, if, you, if you just assume that PlayStation that we had in that list was the old PlayStation where Linux was possible, and that was the whole reason, as I argue, that it never got hacked. It ran Linux already, it didn't get hacked. Never. So now, let's update this for how long did it take un from the point when the system was closed until it got hacked. And then we have just 12 months here, which is pr pretty much the same as the Xbox 360 uh, with, a, with a similar security system anyway. Okay, thanks. Okay, so before we're going to talk about how we can break the security system, we have to talk about how the PS3 actually works. So what Sony did was to ask IBM for their cell processor, which is called the cell broadband engine, and they put it in there. So this is essentially just a 64-bit power PC, and they have like, which is on the bottom left there, and they have like eight SPEs or SPUs. That's synergistic processing element. It's just a fancy name for a vector processor. So each of those things has like 265 kilobyte of memory. Well, had, uh, of memory. Um, this memory can, well, it cannot access the rest of the memory. It can, it can just DMA from and to it. And so they can use this for security because there is this, this special mode. So at the bottom you see the local storage. It's um, usually you have like the whole thing is available from the power PC. You can just read it, you can write to it, you can even stop the SPUs and look what they are doing. You can even write a debugger on the power PC to like totally inspect what's in every single register. However, when isolation mode is enabled, an authenticated binary is loaded, decrypted, and verified by hardware, 
and the local storage gets closed down, all the debug, feature, all the debug features are disabled, so the only thing you see is the pirate marked in green there, which is like a small area used for, com for, used for communication with the PowerPC, and the red area is blocked and only accessible from the SPU itself. So Sony can use this for, to like hide things or implement some stuff they don't want us to see. So then we have um, how code running there. We have the hypervisor at the top, which just which can virtualize multiple logic partitions, and usually the only thing running there is level two or game OS, which is like some kind of kernel that provides support features for games and so on. And games itself are running in problem state, which is the PowerPC user mode. And level two and level one can communicate with the SPU in isolation mode usually. What usually happens, or what Sony does, is that game OS uh, calls level one with some hyper call, tells it to like load the SPU, load some loader on there and let it decrypt stuff. But game OS itself can do this as well. So, and now we're going to talk a bit about the boot process. So what were we first, Okay, that's actually wrong. It's actually a um, bootloader here. Well, yeah, so bootloader essentially loads level zero, which is some PowerPC code running in hypervisor mode. The sole purpose of this code is to bring up the PowerPC, um, bring up another SPU to load medloader, which then loads level one loader. So those are just isolated binaries used for like loading more stuff. And finally, level one gets loaded here. And yeah, just continues with loading another SPU, loading MetLoader again, and loading level two loader. So what MetLoader just does, it decrypts level two loader, then level two loader decrypts level, finally level two, which is then, then running in um, kernel mode on the PS3. So red is SPE and blue is PowerPC. So the, yes. the two CPUs kind of interleave their, their call, their code. Yeah. All right, so um, let's look at the security systems of the different consoles. Uh, each, there's a whole bunch of features that uh, consoles can share in their security systems. So let's compare them. So uh, the first security feature that uh, everyone puts on is a hidden boot ROM that can do something special. Uh, it was implemented in the Xbox One in the uh, Southbridge chip, and every console after that has put it uh, in the CPU, which um, is uh, very nice because you can't easily read it, and obviously you can't override it with a mod chip. So you pretty much need that. Um, after that, uh, of course, uh, people use public key cryptography to authenticate the code that runs on consoles. So um, both the Wii and the 360 uh, have that. And why am I talking? Oh, maybe the next slide. Yeah. So yeah. So, yeah. No, I was looking at the next slide. Okay. So all of the uh, four consoles have that. And uh, the Wii and the 360 also have on die key storage, um, which uh, hides uh, keys uh, so that you can't easily read them from external memory or anything like that. The PS3 kind of has that, but it uh, doesn't work very well. Uh, since we have public key crypto, uh, of course, you want to keep that chain of uh, signed and verified code running from boot, so you need a chain of trust. The Xbox 360 and the PS3 do that. The Wii tries to do that, but uh, they only verify installed code at install time, so that kind of breaks the chain of trust. That's why it doesn't get that uh, point there. Uh, the Wii, the 360, and the PS3 also have for console keys. Uh, the Xbox One did not have that. Uh, so these keys can be used to encrypt uh, things like internal code and um, tickets and things like that. Uh, to be unique to one console. Uh, the Xbox One, the 360, and the PS3 have signed executables. Uh, the Wii doesn't sign executables, it kind of uh, signs packages. So it's an outer layer. Uh, with signed executables of codes, you, of course, you ensure that, um, that uh, any code that you run on the system is authenticated before running it. Uh, the, Wii and the, three, um, the Wii and the PS3 also have a coprocessor. You saw the secure SP on the PS3. And the Wii has what we call the Startlet, which also runs all the security code. So um, this helps isolate the security subsystem from the rest of the code and you know, prevent uh, exploits from sort of leaking into the security stuff. The Wii does something that's really interesting, which is it fully encrypts and signs an entire disk image. So you can't touch any single resource file in a game. It uses a hash tree, which is a little clever construction, and it effectively signs and verifies the entire thing as you uh, read it from the disk, so you can't change anything. The Wii and the PS3 also have encrypted storage. The hard drive on the PS3 and the flash memory on the Wii are both encrypted with a per console key, and uh, so that way you can't easily read it from the outside and figure out what's going on inside the, uh, the internal storage memory of the consoles. 
The Wii, however, also signs that uh, code with, um, with an HMAC signature so that uh, you can't patch stuff into that storage, even if you can decrypt it somehow, without knowing a key that's particular to that console that lets you uh, uh, do that. So that's uh, quite interesting too. Quite important too if you have encrypted storage. Uh, the 360 does memory encryption, which none, none of the other consoles do, and it also does memory hashing. So you can't tap a memory buzz or glitch something in the protected areas of memory. You can't DMA to them. It basically prevents a whole bunch of hardware-based and the DMA-based DMA uh, memory attacks. And uh, the 360 and the PS3 have a hypervisor, which uh, serve, uh, helps supervise uh, other application code running on them and uh, put, does some of the security stuff in the hypervisor. The PS3, however, also has user mode and kernel mode. So the PS3 has all three levels, user, kernel, and hypervisor mode, while the 360 only has kernel and hypervisor mode. It does not do um, user mode. It runs all games in kernel mode. And the Wii runs everything in kernel mode. It doesn't even try to privilege separate stuff on the uh, main CPU. Uh, and uh, the 360 has uh, e-fuses, which are used to prevent downgrades. It actually blows a fuse inside the CPU when uh, you update, uh, when you perform some system updates, and you can't reverse that anyway, so once you run an update, there's no way you can downgrade unless you can break the chain of trust before that check happens, which uh, as far as I know has not happened so far. So uh, these are the features of uh, the consoles. There's one, however, on the PS3 that's already kind of useless, because uh, it's, it turns out the PS3 encrypts stuff with a key that's uh, the same for every sector and the same IV and doesn't hash anything. So they pulled off this neat trick where you can copy a file into your PS3, like a movie or something, then you can find those sectors by watching what changed on the drive, then you take another chunk of the drive, copy it on top, then read the movie back, and it decrypts those sectors that you copied on top for you. So you can do that to decrypt any chunk of the hard drive, and since they don't verify anything, and everything uses the same key and the same IV, it just works. So that encrypted storage is pretty much screwed up to begin with. Okay, so the PS3, however, have other OS, uh, which is a way to run Linux. And uh, as, you, uh, as we saw, well, it's, I'm pretty sure it worked as a deterrent because people could already run code, so why break it? But then Sony decided to uh, get rid of it on the PS3 Slim, which is, you know, it's a, it's a way of drawing attention. So, yeah. <laughs> Because now people are going to start looking at your system, and we know now that there's no technical reason not to have Linux on the PS3 Slim. So it was either marketing or some kind of, you know, boss somewhere said we don't want Linux, or we don't want people running their own code, or we don't know why. But they definitely drew people's attention with this, and now people started trying to hack into the PS3, and uh, GeoHot tried to give it a shot. So uh, you may know that uh, on the Wii, our first exploit was the tweezer attack, which worked by shorting out some RAM address lines and glitching the RAM bus to access areas of memory that we were not supposed to access. Johad did something like that on the PS3. He glitched the RAM bus to essentially access areas that you're not supposed to access. So the way this works usually is uh, you have a hypervisor and you have a kernel on the, on the same chunk of memory, but the hypervisor controls the mage tables to control uh, memory access permissions for the kernel. So when you allocate some memory from the kernel, the hypervisor gives you a mapping to that memory so that you can access it. And when you uh, remove that uh, chunk of memory, it deletes that mapping and you cannot access it anymore. Uh, GeoHot glitched the memory bus right when that write happened so that even though the hypervisor thinks you have that chunk of memory allocated, in reality, it's not actually, um, it's not freed completely because the kernel has still a, uh, a page entry that can access it. So the hypervisor thinks that's free memory, but you can still read and write from it, which is bad. And uh, finally, all you have to do is ask the hypervisor to create a new virtual uh, address space, which means create a new page table. And if you're lucky, it ends up in that chunk of RAM. And then suddenly you have access to the page table. You can read and write from it. If you can write to the page table, you can map the hypervisor. If you can map the hypervisor, you can do anything you want in hypervisor mode. Uh, so that gets us hypervisor exposure. So th this was kind of an academic hack. Uh, it worked, and you could do stuff in hypervisor mode, but it required really annoying hardware to pull off. It was really unreliable. And even when you got hypervisor dumps, no one really knew what to do with them. They were kind of there, and eh, whatever. Sony, for some reason, got really, really, you know, really annoyed at this because they decided to 
piss a lot of people off by removing other OS completely from old PS3s. I'm pretty sure that violates some uh, European consumer protection laws and stuff. So, but the worst part of, it is, is, of this is that the people who use other OS are the hackers. So by doing this, Sony pissed off the hackers. That's a really, really bad idea. Well, in other words, they are still getting hacked now. So for a while, interestingly, nothing really happened. Uh, and uh, obviously, someone was working on this behind the scenes, because then we got the PS jailbreak, and then we got a whole ton of clones of it. So the PS jailbreak is a device that lets you run your own code at LV2 kernel level and above, and it uses a clever USB exploit to do that. Uh, it's actually a USB device that pretends to be multiple USB devices behind a hub. Uh, we'll ignore most of those for now because uh, we've got to keep this short, but the important ones are the first one and the fourth uh, uh, ownage device, as we call them. The first one just delivers a payload as part of a USB information uh, descriptor into the um, the hyper, I mean the uh, LV2, I mean, yeah, the LV2 kernel. Uh, its whole purpose is to put this payload into memory. It doesn't really do anything once it's there. And then device number four uh, gets loaded, and here's where uh, the magic happens. There's some stuff that happened before that, but so device number four has, uh, number four has several configuration descriptors. The first one is loaded from the device, and that works out fine. It gets put into this blue buffer. And then the second descriptor gets loaded, but something weird happens. The PS jailbreak um, does an interesting glitch with USB. When you read a descriptor, it has a total length. But to read the descriptor, you need the length. So it's a chicken and egg problem. USB solves this by reading the first eight or so bytes uh, to begin with. Then you read the length from that. Then you read the whole descriptor again once you know the actual length and you can request all the data. So the PS jailbreak returns uh, a normal descriptor uh, length the first time around when it reads the first eight bytes. Then the second time around, it actually returns zero. That forces the USB uh, code to glitch and never actually copy the descriptor out, because now it thinks it's length th zero, even though it read it. So the funny thing is, well, uh, LV2 is going to try to parse that descriptor that's not actually there. So it's uninitialized memory. What's actually there is it turns out that device number two was plugged in before and then unplugged, and it sort of uh, initialize that memory for LV2. And it has these four uh, funny bytes at the bottom, uh, 04, uh, 21B, 42F. When you parse that as a configuration descriptor, which is what it's going to try to do, it thinks it's a descriptor with length 2FB4, which is really, really long. It's past the buffer. So we've overflowed this buffer, and it, now it tries to load configuration number three, and it jumps 2FB4 bytes forward out the buffer, and into a C++ object array that actually belongs to device number three. Uh, yeah, three. So it puts this configuration descriptor right on top of C++ objects, and it overwrites the vtable of C++ objects to point to the payload. This vtable holds function pointers for things like the destructors and some virtual methods and things like that. So when these objects get destroyed, um, they actually run our own code. So when device number three, which has a bunch of crap that created these objects, gets unplugged, we gain LV2 code execution. So this was implemented by the PS jailbreak and then cloned, and you know, there are a whole bunch of implementations of it. Um, the funny thing is, okay, so this works. Why does it work? Uh, why can't we just run code from data memory? This is a solved problem, right? Well, it turns out that LV2 does not do writes or execute on its kernel. It does not try to protect uh, executable, uh, I mean, data from being executed, which is kind of silly because, you know, we've had this for a while now. But even more importantly, the hypervisor doesn't know anything about this because the hypervisor will happily map any memory you want as executable. Unlike on the 360, where the hypervisor actually verifies anything mapped as, as executable, so it can, it can guarantee that any code running has been signed, on the PS3, the hypervisor doesn't even try to do that. It's a hypervisor meant for virtualizing operating systems, not for security. So it's the wrong kind of hypervisor. It really doesn't do what you want it to do for a security system. It just kind of sits there and looks nice and doesn't protect you from these kinds of bugs. So OK, so we have LV2 compromised. We have not compromised the hypervisor, and we have not compromised uh, the secure SPE. So all those are fine. So what happens now? Well, so why on earth can we pirate games by just compromising LV2? 
Well, it's because the security system makes no sense. So it turns out that you can just copy games to the hard drive, patch LV2 to run them from the hard drive, and LV1 doesn't care, and the security SP doesn't care. So you can break 20% of the security and copy games, which is 100% of what Sony doesn't want you to do. <laughs> so let's go back to our overview of the security features. Uh, obviously, the hypervisor is basically useless because it doesn't prevent you from copying games. So what on earth is it doing? Uh, and it's not uh, preventing you from running your own code either because you can just use an exploit. And uh, the signed executables are also pretty useless because the hypervisor does not enforce them uh, to be signed, to be loaded into memory. You can just ask it for some executable pages. And it just does that. OK, so Sony fixed this, obviously. And uh, when Sony fixed, uh, fixes something, as you might know from the PSP3 uh, scene, everyone thinks, OK, let's downgrade. So uh, people started uh, looking into this. And uh, I th believe it was the people behind the PS jailbreak who also came up with a way of downgrading. And the way that this works is that Sony has a service mode that they use in, um, in their service centers that puts the PS3 into a special mode where it can run some signed code from a USB stick. This service mode is entered by using a USB dongle that uh, does some crypto auth with the PS3. But it turns out it's a symmetric auth. It's, AMA, it's uh, HMAC. And uh, since people had broken into the PS3, they found the keys, dumped them, and made their own clone jigs, which is what they call them. And uh, there was a service app that was signed, that was leaked, that lets you uh, reinstall the operating system on a PS3 without any kind of downgrade check. So you just use this jig, then put this on a USB stick, put an upgrade or well, a, a system install file on a USB drive, and it just installs that without checking if it's older or newer or anything like that. And since people can downgrade, back to piracy. OK, so what we did with uh, this whole PSL rig thing is uh, we wrote as best DOS, which is a replacement for game OS. The idea, I mean, sorry, for, for other OS, the idea is that, well, since game OS and other OS really are kind of the same thing with different permissions, the hypervisor interface is the same, you can basically replace level two with Linux. So uh, Asbestos takes over uh, level two, and uh, then uh, you can pretty much just uh, run, run a Linux kernel, bootload it from a network or something like that, and you can, you can run Linux again, even on a PS3 Slim. It turned out it just worked. There's nothing about the Slim that makes Linux not work. So it was all, you know, the, the reason why it doesn't uh, support it is because they didn't want to support it. And uh, we also added a feature to it that lets you make your PS3 into a dumb slave that you can control from your PC, and you can use this to experiment with Python scripts, uh, poking the hypervisor, poking the SPEs, reading, writing memory, making hypercalls. Basically, it's a way to experiment with PS3, and especially its security system, really, really quickly from a PC environment. OK. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so what have we done so far? So far, we managed to break into level two with, with some um, jig where we have to plug, some, plug something into the U USB bus, then turn it on, press eject, and then it actually runs your code. But um, we want more than that. We want like some vulnerabil vulnerability where we can just turn the PS2, uh, PS3 on and just boot into Linux for us. So to do that, we need to figure out some more stuff, like how does Sony encrypt their elves? So what they do is they take, they build a normal elf, uh, elf using uh, just some compiler and stick a header on top of that. So this is their crypto header marked in blue and green here. And they have each of those loaders running on the isolated SP, SPUs has some loader key, which can be used to decrypt a unique self key. This one is then used to decrypt the rest of the header. And at this point, the signature is checked. So the signature, we're going to talk about that later, is essentially um, all, the blue, all the stuff marked in blue there is signed. So you can't modify any, anything in there. And then the header also has a table of AES keys and SHA-1 hashes so that they can actually encrypt the program headers and make sure that you don't modify them. So as soon as you modify a, somewhere, a bit somewhere in the whole self, it will not work anymore because either some hash is not, uh, doesn't verify anymore or because the signature itself, um, well, is wrong. So, so yeah, those are the, like every code Sony gives you is wrapped into those files so you can't see anything. However, we can just use the SPEs to decrypt the code. So Sony's idea is, yeah, they can't see our code, so they can't find, find bugs in there. 
Well, as soon as we have PowerPC access, we can just ask the SPU to nicely decrypt stuff for us, and it will do so. It does not do any checks on what actually asks you to decrypt, to decrypt things. So with this, we just use asbestos and some, this NetRPC thing, write some Python scripts on the PC, and use it to like decrypt application selves or level two, or like just about every, we can de decrypt just about everything now by just asking it to do it. So we don't even need to know how it works. We just have to ask it to do it for us. But, so yeah, the obfuscation is useless. But we even <laughs> So, but we still want keys. But let's first ta take, take a look at our table again, what we did now. So we have the security code processor there. It's pointless. So and let's go one step back to the train of trust I showed at the beginning. So here we have it again, and I'm not going to explain the, so and on the left you just see what is run in chrono chronological order, and on the right you see the usage. And there are two things there which they can't update. It's bootloader and medloader. So bootloader is the very first thing that runs and just, um, yeah, it's just the very first thing that runs and a meta loader is used to, um, is used to lo load isolated SPU binaries. So they can't update that because it's encrypted with the console specific key. And yeah, the rest can all, they can update all the other things. And they don't want us to downgrade. So they added some revocation. You get the revocation list, they are, they are stored on the NOR or NAND flash as well, and the loaders verify if you try to load some binary, is this on a revocation list, and if it is, it will just re refuse to boot. So the stuff at the top, it cannot be revoked because the previous loaders do not support any kind of revocation lists, so Sony did something else there. So first, it reads bootloader, LV, LV0, metloader, LV, LV1 loader, and LV1 from the, from the NAND or from the NOR on your PS3s and just runs them. And then once LV1 runs, it loads all that stuff again to verify it. So you can just remove the NOR, plug in a mod chip in there. So when it's read first, you supply your downgraded um, version. Then when the PS3 reads it for the second time, you supply the real version it's supposed to run and it will just run because it thinks uh, like, yeah, I am running the current version so I can just continue to boot. And this allows us to like downgrade everything because we can just downgrade the revocation list as well, so the revocation is useless. It's just some kind of specification thing. There's no revocation there. So as soon as we break one loader, we break it forever. And we can forever own all PS3s out there. So we need to do that. <laughs> so here we have lo the local storage again. It's an isolated mode, so you can't access the red stuff. Only the SPU itself can do that but you can access the green stuff and you need to supply a revocation list. So this list is of course signed and encrypted, so they have to copy it to the, um, to the pr protected part because they don't want you, if they would decrypt it in place and check the signature in place, you could just like wait for it to do that and then at the right time write some PowerPC code to modify it. So they really have to copy it. And here's how they do that. So what's wrong here? The problem is that we have the destination buffer lies before LV2 loader code. The SOAR buffer, so we control the source and we control the length of the source. So what if we just write some really, really huge value there? Well, we overwrite LV2 loader code and run code in isolated SPU mode. Then we can just go ahead and dump their keys. Just write something to pu push them over to the power PC and then, yeah. Then we can actually reverse the whole loader and we get some keys there. <laughs> So what are the implications of this? So it's only a bug in one isolated loader. However, if we put such a modified uh, revocation list onto the um, NOR flash, the hypervisor will just load it. It does not care about the size and that, co that code actually works and will just supply a really huge re revocation list to uh, like LV2 loader. Then we patch LV2 loader to ignore signatures and well, we get our code running at boot time without any kind of dongles or stuff. And this breaks the chain of trust pretty early. <laughs> so as you can see there, this is fail, but we promised epic fail, so we'll have to look further. <laughs> yes. 
So let's go back to the table. Well, the chain of trust is broken. And back to the selves. We now like how just about everything works here, except for the signature part. So how do they do that? How does the signature thing work? So this is ECDSA and it's some crazy math stuff that guy over there is going to explain now. <laughs> Hi. Okay, so the thing we are trying to do is figure out a private key they use to, to put signature on all the files. Uh, you normally cannot do that, of course, that's why it's a good crypto system. Uh, uh, in ECDSA, there's a lot of parameters that are public, that B, A, B, G, N, Q, E, R, S, whatever. Uh, but there are two things that are private uh, in, a, in a single signature. That's K, the private key, which we want to have. And it's M, which is supposed to be a random number. Okay, next slide. Okay, so how does someone who signs something calculate uh, the numbers R and S, which are the signature? Well, R is done by, uh, by scalar multiplication of base point of the elliptic curve, blah, 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 difficult stuff. It's the difficult problem that, uh, uh, that's the base of uh, the security of all elliptic curve crypto. Uh, but S is just calculated as normal numbers. Um, well, so that, uh, uh, that first equation uh, we cannot solve. No one in the world can solve it. So let's just ignore it. But the second equation, uh, it's, it's got two unknowns in it now, K and M. So we cannot solve for it either. But M is supposed to be a random number. And for some reason, Sony uses the same random number all the time. <laughs> So, so there at the top are, is, uh, are the two equations again, but twice now, like we have two, uh, two separate signatures. Uh, we're going to ignore that top one again because it's difficult, right? Uh, but now at uh, 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 the equation for S1 and S2, uh, we still have only two unknowns because it's the same M. It's supposed to be a different M every time. Then we've got three unknowns, only two equations. Don't wait to solve it. But now we've got... Uh, only two announced. So uh, it's, it's trivial to just solve for M by just, uh, uh, you take the two, uh, the, uh, the two formulas, subtract them, um, whatever, just a bit of formula manipulation, and then you solve M, and then you've got M, and you just fill it in, and then you solve for K. So we've, we've got a private key without, uh, without even having to know most of, uh, most of the curve parameters and anything. So th we actually used ECDSA in the Homebrew Channel's uh, network update functions so that someone can't own your Wii through a man-in-the-middle attack or something. So this is how we do it, right? We do the EC mat. You can see the M times EG, blah, 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 stuff there. And for M, we read cryptographically secure random numbers from devrandom on Linux. Uh, you know, that's what you're supposed to do and what Sony does is, well... And, of course, as uh, Sekhar explained, if you use the same M, you can calculate K once you have two signatures. And if you have K, well, that's a private key. And with a private key, you can sign things. <laughs> so these signatures are every bit as valid as Sony's official signatures. They are indistinguishable. And we can, we can get keys for LV2, we can get keys for LV1, we can get keys for uh, revocation lists, we can get keys for uh, hypervisor configuration files, which is interesting, and for packages and a whole bunch of stuff. So um, We actually don't have keys for level one because sorry, yeah. we can't run that loader because it does weird hardware stuff, so we still have to figure that out. Yeah, sorry. So, in fact, you can get the keys if you have the, um, 
the plain text for all the loaders, but right now Sony's security for the few loaders that uh, haven't been dumped yet hinges on just the AES stuff that we don't have and the per console key, but everything that you need to get these keys is inside a PS3, you just have to get to it. So back to the table here, well, <laughs> they botched the public key crypto, so that's a big fail. And we're left with user kernel mode within the on die boot room, which are not exactly high tech security features. So, pretty much botched the entire thing. So, thanks, Sony. <laughs> All right. Coming soon. <laughs> Looks like we might have a little bit of time for questions for Q and A. We're actually going to try to do a demo of this, and we were going to do it now, but as usual, demos are late or don't work. Uh, in fact, we have video issues the same way we had video issues with the BootMe demo uh, two years ago. So we're going to try to fix that, and we're trying to schedule a lightning talk tomorrow to uh, get that uh, presented. So if you have any questions, we have two microphones on the left and on the right. Please line up. And if you're afraid of asking questions in public, the people are down at the Hex Center. I got a question. Um, do you know where the PS jailbreak came from? Not a clue. <laughs> Seriously, not a clue. We can guess, but we, you know, we don't have any proof of absolutely anything. Um, we think it's somewhere from the southern hemisphere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, right now, um, I noticed that the uh, not only the um, exploits, but uh, the USB stack exploit, but also the, the, the payload has been completely reverse engineered. So uh, there are there's source code available right now. Uh, everything? Yeah, the, well, right now, Asbestos is public, ha has been for a while. It contains an implementation of the USB exploit that runs on uh, TI OMAP processors. There are a whole bunch of uh, clones for other chips. And, of course, there's also a reverse engineered payload for that if you want to replicate the original PS uh, jailbreak functionality instead of running Linux. That's out there right now. Our stuff, uh, we, well, we did some pretty terrible hacks to make it work for the demo, hopefully tomorrow. So we need to clean things up and make it saner. But, I mean, I expect that in the next month or something like that, we'll uh, release clean tools for the stuff we did with, that we did here. Thank you. Okay, a uh, question from the RFC. Um, now that you can sign your own code, why can't you create a Blu-ray software payload? Could you repeat that? Someone asked, um, now that you can sign your own code, why can't you create a Blu-ray software payload? So we actually don't have the key to sign uh, games because that's app loader and uh, they changed those keys uh, several times. Actually, no, they didn't change those keys, but we don't have it. Why don't we have it? Because we, we don't have an exploit in app loader, sorry. Uh, so yeah, you need the plain text of the loader to get the public key and once they have the public key then, yeah. So we can't sign games and also we don't really care about games because we care about low level access. It, it's probably possible eventually, but we're not planning on working on it. Yeah. 